This is the current federal tax developments for the week of November the 29th, 2021. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers coming to you this week from Phoenix here the day after Thanksgiving. We actually have a few things to talk about this week, although for all practical purposes, it was a rather quiet week with Thanksgiving and short week with Thanksgiving. But let's talk about what we do have here. One thing that came out on Wednesday was the IRS brought forth the draft instructions for Form 1065. And they have a number of additions this year. And we'll talk about what's there and maybe also look at some of the reasons why the IRS is doing what they're doing. We are continuing with all of the past through entities to see the IRS not so much focus on brand new things anymore in terms of new laws, changes, requirements in place, but rather go back and start talking about things that have been true for years, but that the IRS is now putting requirements into the forms to allow them to figure out if taxpayers are actually properly following those rules or indicate a direction the IRS is pushing in terms of where they think maybe people aren't properly complying. We're also going to have the IRS gave the first guidance they've given following the passage of the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act about how pay how employers are supposed to deal with the fact that the fourth quarter 941 will not qualify for employee retention credit, at least most employers won't, unless they're a recovery startup business. And how do we deal with the fact that this change was passed by Congress after the quarter began, in fact, well after the quarter began, and what do employers do who may have reduced their payroll tax deposits? We'll talk about some of the odd things there, or ones that had sent in a Form 7200 asking for an advance payment. We have a couple of discussions there. We're also going to talk about a presentation made by an IRS representative at a virtual conference where she began discussing the fact that the IRS is going to begin training auditors early next year looking toward getting up to speed on doing employee retention tax credit audits and some discussions they had at that conference about speculations on the types of employers that might be more likely to see exams come after them. And then finally, we'll talk about a case that really is very similar to a case we discussed earlier this year. But again, the IRS ran into issues when their identity theft prevention systems ended up stopping the IRS from processing return, and we get into the middle of another statute of limitations question where the IRS had treated a return rejected, therefore not filed by the taxpayer, that eventually we're going to discover the courts are going to say, IRS, we don't care about your ID theft rules. The case law has been around for a long time. And yeah, no question, if that was not, if that was actually a return that wasn't filed by the taxpayer, yeah, the statute wouldn't have been tripped. But the reality is that this return was filed by the taxpayer. And for that reason, you know, it's going to be no problem. That return will have been filed uh, in time in this case to get a claim for refund in place so they could get the refund in question. Well, let's start first with this IRS 2021 instructions for Form 1065. The IRS released a draft as of November the 24th of the 1065 instructions. So as of Wednesday, we have a new set of draft instructions. And they actually deal with about three topics right now that are new to the instructions or at least revised to the instructions uh, that weren't there for the 2020 version of the form. But the one I'm going to concentrate the most on is the issue that the IRS spends some time finally dealing with something that's actually been around or at least a case that's been around for a decade which is the Rankmeyer case. These new instructions are out now, and they talk about three main areas they're going to talk about here are change or self-employment tax reporting by a partnership. They're going to talk about uh, the issue of the syndicate rules and 163J, and they're going to talk a bit about uh, some additional changes or some clarifications for tax basis capital accounts, mainly going around the 743B issue That seemed to have everybody all worked up forever. No, they're not changing it really, but they're making it clearer how it's supposed to be handled. So now if you're still upset and you want 743B numbers to be on, you know, the uh, 1065 on the balance sheet, 
you're still not going to like this, but they do have some more information on it. But let's talk specifically, though, about the section they added for self-employment income reporting. And the IRS added a paragraph that was put into here that specifically talks about the fact that you judge whether somebody is limited partner for federal tax purposes. Uh, you've got to look at recent court cases or not so recent for that matter, because the key case they're going to reference here is the case of Rank Meyer. Uh, a full name of that is Rank Meyer Campbell and Weaver LLP versus Commissioner. That was 136 TC 137. And that actually came out in 2011. So a decade ago, we ended up getting the Rankmeyer case. And what the IRS is telling us is one of the positions they're going to take is mainly in Rankmeyer, we're concerned about the level of interactions that partners have with the partnership. Now, the one thing to be very clear about here is Rankmeyer and one that I'll also discuss in the article, Castigliola, neither of those dealt with things that were actually limited partnerships. Rather, they deal with LLPs or LLCs, uh, which, again, are different under state law from a true limited partnership. So in both cases, they said, in fact, Rankmeyer, the opinion is fairly clear going back a decade that the, con you know, the tax court said, look, Congress, there was no such thing as LLCs when Section 1402A13 that exempted income to limited partners from the tax, from self-employment income, when that was added to the law. And the court noted at the time that it was really added as an anti-abuse measure. Conceptually at the time, the concern was that somebody who had, did not have enough quarters of coverage to qualify for Social Security could go out, buy a partnership investment, a limited partnership investment, so they didn't really have any liability issues, not actually participate because under state law, you know, you generally couldn't participate and remain a limited partner, but then sit there and accumulate their quarters to get their 40 quarters to get coverage for Social Security. They would pay in the SE. And at the low end, and especially then, uh, it was going to be a very good deal if you could qualify for your Social Security. While if you had never actually done, you know, had earned income or at least not had income that was subject to Social Security taxes in your entire career. Uh, you know, it was like you were going to build that up at the lower end, which was a really great investment. And it's actually not a bad investment today. Again, if you stay at the very low end, again, when we start getting income up significant at all, then the uh, whole deal looks a little bit worse, uh, especially if you are either not married or your spouse, you know, has earned his or her own coverage. Uh, the deal may not look nearly as good, but at the very low end for anybody, yeah, it, it looks good because of the high level you pay up till a certain minor amount. Obviously, you could dial this in. So what the tax court said was really they weren't so much concerned about people not being liable for debts. That wasn't their concern. Their concern was that these people weren't actually doing anything. And that was the concern about limited partners qualifying for Social Security based on not really having done anything. So they, they changed that. They put the law in there. So in Rankmeyer, they specifically looked at the level of investment that the partners had made in this law firm, which was very, very minor, about 100 bucks. Uh, they looked at what was really generating the income from this law firm, which was the litigation that was being pursued by the various attorneys that would lead to all the legal fees and items and decided that actually these guys should be paying self-employment tax. We did a similar thing with the Castigliola case. That was not quite as aggressive a position. Unlike Rankmeyer, which tried to get out of subemployment tax entirely, in Castigliola, they tried to pay a guaranteed payment that was equal to reasonable compensation. And in the Castigliola case, that particular issue in Castigliola was TC Memo 2017-62, came out in April of 2017, there they had paid a guaranteed payment that they claimed was equal to reasonable comp, and let's just assume it was. So they're kind of like an S-corp. They would say, well, we took reasonable comp out. We're paying self-employment tax on that. So therefore, you know, we don't need to worry about self-employment tax on any excess earnings. And the court said, well, we like your theory, but the problem is that really that there's nothing in partnership law that allows that. And number two, uh, 
the Rankmeyer case pretty much gives us the outline for what to do. Now, what's interesting about the instructions, though, is that it actually has a statement that says state law treatment as a limited partner is not determinative. And that's not really a concept directly discussed in either Rankmeyer or Castigliola. And I realize I don't mention Castigliola. That's probably the other big case that we had in this area. But the IRS is definitely mentioning it now. Now, that was a feature some old timers may remember that was in the old stealth tax regulations, uh, where a limited partner might not be granted the exemption from 1402A13. That caused a big hassle back in the mid-90s. Uh, it became Newt Gingrich became involved in that. Lots of things happened. But that's actually a concept now brought back from there. But I think what the IRS is probably aiming for here, there would be a case where somebody takes out, let's say, a general partnership interest of some minor amount, pays self-employment tax on that number, and then claims to have also issued themselves a limited partnership interest that has the right to get the vast majority of the income. And while the proposed regs back in the stealth tax days, which the IRS has said unofficially on numerous occasions you could still rely upon, in those situations, that type of dual ownership only works. You know, having a limited partnership interest that we're going to recognize, not pay a C tax on, if there are other partners who do not have the general interest, do not perform services, and would qualify based on lack of services as limited under those regs. If that happened and those people have, let's say, put in 100 grand and they're getting 10% of the earnings, if this active partner put in his own 100 grand, he could get 10% of the earnings that way too. But you need somebody else on the same terms, but who was not performing services, that kind of proved it wasn't disguised services. My guess is the IRS is kind of reminding us of that here and saying, you know, if you try to, you try to like pretty it up by having two different classes of interest, one of which you claim is limited, the other one which you claim is not, uh, even if it's a limited partnership, they're going to say no, because actually you're active in the business. Uh, you're really doing things. This is compensation for what you're doing. It's not an investment of capital. You have to test those things in question. The court does, or I should say the opinion, the instructions, get the right name here, actually do mention the Rankmeyer decision specifically, cite it back to us so we can go look at it. Certainly, if you have not looked at the Rankmeyer decision, you've been doing partnerships for years, and you've never read Rankmeyer, and you're making decisions on what self-employment income for something like a limited liability company, uh, and you're focusing on that word limited, you might want to read Rankmeyer because obviously Rankmeyer said, quit focusing on limited, that's irrelevant. Uh, we don't care about limited liability. What we care about is activity involved. And so you can look at Rankmeyer, you know, you know, you can look at that, you can look at Castigliola uh, in those cases. We've had a few cases over the years that have allowed us to look at this area and make different decisions. If it primarily the partner is there through investment in capital, and that's what they're earning off of, that'll be considered limited partnership interest. If, however, the partner is making very little investment in capital uh, and is actually involved in the business actively, that tends to become not limited partner under the Rankmeyer kind of outline of what they do. Uh, we saw that later on a few years after, I think at the same year as Actually, it was 2017, the same year as we saw Castigliola. We had the Hardy case, which held where the court used Rankmeyer to tell the IRS, sorry, this guy is not considered having SE income. Rather, he's considered to be merely an investor. So we ended up with the Hardy case, the Castigliola case, Rankmeyer case. Those are all the cases to kind of take a look at to see how this goes. Now, I did say there were a couple of other things the IRS brought up in these draft instructions. One of which was an area that gets very sticky if you're in real estate. And, you know, you've got real estate uh, promoter who's assembling a bunch of partnerships. And you're worried about the 163J interest limitation rules. And you think, well, we're safe because none of these partnerships have over $25 million in revenue. And we're not combining or maybe we just don't have $25 million for all of them. So we don't need to aggregate in any way, shape, or form. Now, that's all well and good. However... We need to be aware of the fact that that exception for not needing to apply the interest limitation rules only applies if you're below the revenue limits 
and you're not a tax shelter, and very specifically, you're not a syndicate is going to be the subpart that gets us in trouble. And they do point out if 35% of the losses are being allocated uh, to people that don't actively participate in the business for the most part, you're going to be subject to 163J. And I think a lot of these real estate structures are automatically subject to 163J. And therefore, uh, you probably need to become an electing real estate business in order to get out of J and give up any thought of bonus depreciation in order to avoid the 163J cap on your interest, because that would be devastating. Yeah, I, I can't do accelerated depreciation on qualified improvement property. That's not nice, but that's a lot better than not being able to ever deduct the interest on a partnership that is highly leveraged, as many of these would be. And the third thing we did, we got some more clarification of the capital account rules the IRS wants you to follow. There's clarification there about how you handle 743B. If you've actually included an income, how you back it off to make sure it's not on the balance sheets. There are various other types of clarifications that we have here. Now, why all of these are interesting is none of them are driven by underlying changes in the law. We haven't seen the code change for any of these to drive them. Rather, well, at least not since TCJA, which was back in 2017. So we're waiting quite a few years now, and suddenly we're picking up these issues. My take on that is this is so the IRS can say, look, it's in the instructions. We told you about that. We're not going to take any argument on, you know, any sort of case coming down the future. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. I didn't know what it was. You know, people trying to say I shouldn't have been aware of this thing, so I shouldn't be penalized. Yeah, the service is telling you we're, we're looking at this. And we've certainly seen some litigation on the SE area, self-employment area, before. But I would suspect that 163J and mentioning the syndicate rules indicates that the service may be beginning to get interested there. And they really do care about this capital, the capital account bill, deal, tax basis capital. And as I've told you before from looking at their penalty relief that they gave us last year in revenue procedures, uh, you need to be aware that they are planning, it appears from what they're telling us, to assert failure to file penalties for the 1065 as well as failing to give information returns, the K-1s, that are proper to the partners and failing to give them to the IRS. Those are three penalties that when you start adding them up over time can become really big. So be aware of these things in these draft instructions that the IRS is adding that we need to be aware of. Well, we're going to have some more employee retention credit guidance because, hey, you know, it's been a while since we've done that. The IRS, on the 24th, they were busy on Wednesday before everybody went for Thanksgiving. They published on their website an, an article called Early Termination of the Employee Retention Credit for Most Employers. And that's on their website. And what they said there, they mentioned the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act repealed the employee retention credit for the fourth quarter of 2021 for businesses except for recovery startup businesses. So if you're not going to be able to get the employee retention credit, if you had a decline in gross receipts of 20% or more in the third or fourth quarter, you won't be able to get that for quarter four. Or if you were fully or partially uh, basically shut down in the fourth quarter. We can't qualify under those two tests. We now have to go into just recovery startup business. That is an employer that began a trade or business after February 15th of 2020. Now, the problem with that is, of course, that we did this well after the quarter had begun. You know, we finally got this thing passed on November 5th. The House passed it. November 15th, the president signed the bill. So 15 is kind of a nice date. We're basically halfway through the quarter. And now suddenly the law has changed and these employers who aren't recovery start businesses cannot get the employee retention credit. Well, there's some problems there. And so this is the first time Harris deals with some of those problems. The most obvious one is, let's say that you're an employer who expected to have the ERC apply for the fourth quarter. Why would you have expected it? Well, because I know I had a 20% drop in the third quarter of 2021 versus the third quarter of 2019. 
And if that was true, remember, because we can elect to look back a quarter, you therefore might have thought, hey, wait, I automatically qualify for quarter four. And I'm sure some employers who may have taken updates or, you know, ERC lectures, been setting in on various uh, programs, you know, might have heard the story back before the infrastructure bill, you know, came up in Congress in August. And this got added on that, hey, well, you know, in the third quarter, if you're down 20 percent, you're going to automatically qualify for the fourth, which was the way it stood after the American Rescue Plan Act. But now we have this bill going back and pulling the rug out from these people. Well, these people may very well have already reduced their payroll tax deposits. Remember, that was how we were supposed to get this credit, right? We reduced our payroll tax deposits. That allowed us to keep the money. Well, the IRS recognizes that probably means these people are underpaid and behind in paying their taxes currently. And at least theoretically now sitting there with late deposit problems. And what the IRS tells us essentially on this page is, uh, we're going to get back to you. But the real advantage of this statement on the page, which is, you know, await further guidance, is that the IRS is now officially committing to giving us guidance on how we're supposed to fix this. And implied in that is how we're not going to be penalized for this. And that's the position I've been saying was almost certain to happen from the service ever since we first saw the possibility of this thing getting repealed after the beginning of this quarter. So we're going to probably be seeing that happen. The other issue comes in with the Form 7200 that you would file in order to try to get your, you know, advance money. If after reducing your deposits, you still ended up with a balance that was owed you by the government. Under the ERC, we could fax in a Form 7200 and ask for that advance to be paid to us. Now, What's going to happen this time is the IRS needs to deal with it. They're sitting on a bunch of 7200s that were faxed in. Now, a chunk of those are probably related to businesses that are not recovery startup businesses. Rather, they're the other businesses that believe they're going to qualify. So the IRS has announced on those they had not finished, they had not processed. They're going to take a look at those. And if you didn't check the box saying that you were a recovery startup business on the fourth quarter Form 7200, those other 7200s are going to essentially reject and send back to you and saying, nope, we're not going to pay the money out. The idea is to reverse that so we're not making a bigger hole for these people. But they also tell us that they understand that there are going to be some people who already got paid who are going to qualify based on quarter three. The IRS paid them. Now, you might wonder, why was the IRS paying those if they knew it was likely that this thing would be reversed? And my take on that is, really, the IRS can't get ahead of the game here. You know, they are not Congress. And there was at least a reasonable level of uncertainty about whether the entire situation with both the Build Back Better Act and then the linkage of that to the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that the IIJA might never be passed, in which case then they would qualify for that. The law says they can be paid, so that's what happened. Well, the IRS is going in this one and saying essentially the same thing they said about those reduced deposits. You know, keep watching this space, and we'll tell you eventually what we're going to do to fix this up. But you need to watch and, you know, we'll kind of work this out. So any clients that have done it or if your company's done it, uh, you need to be aware to keep your eyes open for future IRS guidance about how we're going to handle this shortfall that would now exist for anybody who reduced their payroll tax deposits or got that 7200, that form 7200 refund money back to them. How we're going to fix that and get you back up to the right payroll tax level. The one caveat is we're going to have to fix it. You know, the IRS does not suggest at all that somehow this will all be waived. Uh, That would probably get a lot of people upset if if we just waived this without simply saying, okay, you get the ERC on all wages paid through, you know, the date of enactment. So through October, through November 15th. And that doesn't seem likely to happen. I don't think the IRS has the authority in any way, shape or form to do that. And it really doesn't seem like Congress is likely to do it either. But we have more ERC stuff because, hey, why not? This is an article by Kristen A. Perillo that was in Tax Notes Today Federal on the 23rd. 
the title being IRS gearing up for audits of employee retention credits. That probably gets some people's attention, just the title of that article. Well, what happened in this case was that Kristen was covering a IRS virtual conference that was the New England IRS Representation Conference. And speaking at that conference was Julie Forster of the IRS Small Business Self-Employed Division. And she was quoted essentially as saying at this conference that they are going to begin training agents in the February-March time frame over how to examine agents at various levels over how to examine tax returns, payroll tax returns, to determine if somebody appropriately claimed the employee retention credit or whether they should be going after them to pay part of it back. Now, she didn't commit on when exams would begin because she said that for practical purposes, it's going to depend on the progress they can make on getting the training, getting things together. But remember, they're going to have three years on everyone except for the fourth quarter, on the third and fourth quarter. So they have three years from April 15th of the year following the quarter where you claim the refund. And 2021s are clearly going to be the big refund. So technically, the statutes haven't even started yet on the big set, which would be this year's set of them, because this year it's 70% of up to 10 grand per quarter. And, you know, and also you may not have gotten a PPP2 loan because you may not have qualified for that, but you got a PPP1 loan, you know, all of those things. So you might not have been able to do as much last year. It was a lot more questionable. You might have even blown it when you did your PPP forgiveness application and cost yourself a bunch of credit due to having, you know, only listed wages on your form for getting forgiveness. So I expect the 21 numbers to be much bigger than 20 numbers in that realm. But in any event, the IRS still has three years to examine that. They'll have another year to examine the first six months of this year and then another, and basically, and then what will be another three years to examine the third quarter and fourth quarter filings. So they're going to be doing it. Now, on the same panel, it appears from what I can see when, um, when Kristen wrote, when she wrote about this, we had uh, Daniel Mayo of Witham Smith and Brown PC, and he was discussing, you know, kind of speculating on, well, you know, the real interesting thing to him was, how are we going to see the IRS select people for exams here? You know, I said, well, obviously, bigger ones are more interesting to the service than small ones. If somebody asks for $500 back, it's tough to make money on exams doing that. But he also speculated, and I think his speculation here makes some sense, that the IRS might concentrate on the industry you're involved in. Because the ERC was aimed mainly, to be honest, when we first thought about pulling it out, at restaurants and entertainment venues and people who are being really clobbered by this. Now, we all know there have been some people out there pushing some very, very aggressive positions on you know what qualifies, especially as full or partial shutdown. Uh, the receipts test is fairly mechanical. That one I'm not as concerned about, assuming you got the calculation right for receipts. But the full partial shutdown, I have definitely heard of some rather extreme positions being pushed on full partial shutdown. So I could certainly see the IRS, who also is, I'm sure, fully aware of the positions being pushed, uh, going out there and taking a look and wondering, hey, you know, we're really wondering how you, you know, as a, you know, let's say an accounting firm, that was showing, you know, it was an essential business whose revenues we can see from your tax returns went up dramatically. You know, they were actually up over the 2019, not down. Uh, you know, how were you shut down? You know, what, what was your shutdown option and what are you claiming was the shutdown? And I could certainly see them coming into some industries very skeptical about how the shutdown worked for that industry and how it did, especially for a company that otherwise appears to have done very, very well. Uh, coming out of 2020 and 2021. And, you know, the IRS representative, Ms. Forster, was not really, you know, she said, yeah, we're working on that sort of thing. So just be aware. Definitely the IRS appears to be working this. Now, is this a bunch of threats, saber rattling that will never come to anything? Can't say for sure. 
But clearly the service may look at it. And remember, we're starting to see more hearings being held on fraud in the PP loan program, congressional hearings. I wouldn't doubt we'll see congressional hearings about ERC fraud as well. And that's the sort of thing that puts pressure on the service to actually go out there and, you know, show they're doing something in that area. So that's an interesting aside. Keep your eyes on it and, you know, make sure you're ready to defend any client or your own business. If you got the ERC credits, you want to be sure about your background and what, and as I would say for anybody who is, you know, in the advisor role or you're, you're the tax person involved with it, you want to go back and find the actual specific authorities that back up your position. If you're claiming that you had a full or partial suspension of business, what are the exact authorities you're relying upon? Are you in line with notice 2020-20 with 2021-20? Say that right. Which actually has most of the information about the IRS's definition of what is a partial suspension and partial is generally going to be our main area. That's probably going to be the disputes because that's the most interesting area. Or are you kind of going out beyond that level? And my own take on that, you're going out beyond that level whenever you're trying to say that customers, reduction or lack of customers is your problem because notice 202120 makes it pretty clear that if your problem is only lack of customers, you know, in essence, customers didn't show up not the inability to actually handle the customers who did show up because, you know, you had to put procedures in due to COVID restrictions that were so restrictive that you just couldn't, you had to turn people away, not because, let's say, they were violating something that was a restriction on them. Notice 202120 specifically says that mask mandates are not considered to be a significant restriction. I would assume they take the same ruling on something like a vaccine mandate, but I can flip that a little. If, in fact, because you had to assign staff to verify vaccination status, and if that took enough time, then that conceivably, using the retail store examples, could get you enough of a restriction. And what's enough? Who knows? But that might get you to the point of saying, well, that was a severe restriction. Let's say in the extreme that by having to do that vaccine check, I could only you know, handle one out of 10 people that came in there, not because it was turning away nine out of 10 because they weren't vaccinated, but because I just never got around to checking nine out of 10 because, you know, we were so backed up. They just didn't, they weren't there. They were being turned away. They were leaving because we just couldn't process them. That's my problem. So the way I think about that is I've stated on Twitter was let, let's assume you have an infinite supply of customers that would comply with any such mandate of that sort. Now, is the fact that you're having to check status such an onerous burden that you're not able to handle that infinite supply, you know, or at least the normal number from the infinite supply you could have handled without that restriction on you? I think that's where you start looking at things like that. So it gets a lot more interesting. And like I say, I've seen some very, very aggressive positions. And I, I think you got to be careful. You need to know notice 202120 20, very well. And even if you're going to take a position that disagrees with it, you need to know the IRS position to be ready to, for the defense as to why that position in the notice is in error. I certainly am not saying the IRS positions are all perfect and that the courts will ultimately come down and back every one of them. But you really need to be ready. You know, you're kind of on notice. They're out there when they're sitting there. So you need to have your solid argument about why they're in error if you are going to take a position that appears to be totally contrary to what's in the notice. Finally, let's talk about Willits versus Commissioner. This is a tax court summary opinion, 2021-39, came out on the 22nd. And I found it interesting because we had already talked about uh, earlier this year, you know, the case of Fowler v. Commissioner, actually it was last year, September of 2020, which was a case where the IRS, again, in that case, the taxpayer had an IP pin that they'd been given. The taxpayer tries to electronically file the return on October 15th. The IRS refuses to accept the return because the IP pin was not included. There was a bunch of back and forth, and it took a few months before the taxpayer actually got a document submitted that clearly had the IP pin on it. And then the IRS came by three years later 
you know, over three years after October 15th, the, orig the original extended due date, the original date they some try to submit the return, but less than three years after the date, they finally got that one with the IP pin in and said, well, we still got time. We're assessing tax. And the court said, you, you can't go back and assess tax any longer. Your statute was closed. Well, this is a close relative, though the actual issue is one where the taxpayer is the one that is kind of exposed. We're looking at a refund in this case, not a tax due. So Mr. Willett had filed an extension to file his 2014 return through October 15th of 2015. Now, while he did that, he didn't actually file the return. He had paid money in with his extension, and it turns out that had he filed the return, he was going to be overpaid by just over $1,500. But he hadn't really got it done. Now, on April 14th of 2018, Mr. Willett actually files his 1040 for the year in question. So now he sends in the 1040. However, the IRS was concerned about potential identity theft on this return, trying to get a refund from three years earlier and filed on the last day for filing. So the IRS probably, as a lot of you have seen already, I was working with a client last week, you know, who had to verify her identity uh, with the IRS. So they would continue and process the return. Well, apparently Mr. Willits got trapped in that situation. Now, the court says it is not clear if he did or did if he did and didn't get the notice about that. It's not clear what happened. It's not clear what went on. But it is clear the IRS had noted in their files that they had received this document in May of 2018. And they had basically said, well, we think it might be ID theft. And so they had steps they wanted Mr. Wolf to take. And Mr. Willett never took those steps. Now, again, we don't know if they're properly communicated. The court didn't really look into that because it turns out the court won't consider that to be a key issue. Uh, Mr. Willett, you know, eventually, as I say, it was rejected due to concern it was ID theft. Okay, in 2019, after the three-year period is done, because remember, you have three years from the original due date of filing the return, uh, including extensions, to file the return and claim a refund that was on that original return that would have been due to you. So in 2019, the IRS contacts Mr. Willett again. You know, the the, uh, the basically the non-reporter division sends out a notice, says, we, we don't show you have any records you ever filed your 2014 tax return. Mr. Willett responds to that notice by sending a copy of the 2014 return that he had sent to the IRS in April of 2018 and which the IRS had a record of receiving, you know, and then rejecting in May of 18. Now, the IRS says, thank you very much for that. Too bad about your refund because you're filing more than three days, more than three years late. So tough luck. You've made a contribution to the Treasury of $1,553. Taxpayer says no, they go to tax court summary of summary court. And this was a case where the taxpayer represented himself. And realistically, and the court does a pretty good job pointing this out, this was not really a case that the IRS had a chance of winning. Historically, there were cases where the courts had already held IRS rejection of a return. As long as that return met all requirements, and then we do discuss in the case, you know, what are some of the requirements that you have to have to be a valid claim? But he filed a thing that purported to be a return. It had a, more than enough information to properly compute the tax, had all the information to properly compute the tax. He did sign under penalties of perjury, and it was delivered to the IRS within the statute time frame. The court said that's basically the four things that have to happen. If those four things happen, we don't care, IRS, that you rejected this return because you suspected it might be ID theft. Rather, we're just going to go ahead and treat this as he timely filed asking for his $1,553 back. And therefore, IRS, you need to pay this. Now, this is interesting because, as I said, why do cases like this happen? And sometimes you see cases like this, especially in TC summary opinions, and when the taxpayers representing themselves, because I think a lot of the problem here was there was not a professional that could have basically, you know, 
cut this off at the pass early by noting, IRS, you have no leg to stand on in this case, right? You know, we got all kinds of case law that says as long as those are met, and the IRS even agreed the return was proper, it had the proper amount of tax, you know, it was signed by him, they weren't disputing that that document was correct, and they weren't, and they clearly couldn't dispute that it arrived well before the three years were up because they had the record in May, they had it and kicked it back. So, you know, the court said basically this was all over. Well, obviously, yeah, a, a prepare, you know, I, I think most of us, if we did any research in the area, we would have probably very quickly told service, you really don't have a leg to stand on. This thing's going to go. But of course, at $1,553, let's also be honest about another real fact of life here. The odds are that at that $1,553, there's no way this taxpayer, it would not have been cost effective to dispute that by paying for most professionals. Because probably, given it's an exam, given the fun of getting a hold of the IRS, given the fun of the back and forth, I think there's a really high chance that it wouldn't take much or many IRS back and forth and this letters and all the other things we need to do to get this straightened out. To have run up a professional bill of over $1,500 in order to try to get this $1,500 back. So I fully understand why the taxpayer probably did not seek professional advice because, you know, it make, makes little sense to pay $4,000 to get $1,500 back. And while that $4,000 probably would have prevented going to tax court, we understand the trade-off. But the problem we have here is it does illustrate, though, that the IRS at many levels, especially the levels we're talking about, the notices and other levels below appeals, let's say, below supervisory and exam and, you know, and obviously below those that up in court, that they're just on autopilot. And especially with a new program like these for ID theft, the computer systems, which are ancient and were never designed for these sorts of things, are going to get a date entered once the return is processed. And that's really going to be the key. And they'll put in, you know, all the dates there. Now, obviously, we're going to have a record of this return not being processed or not being received back until after the extended due date, so they keep moving. Same issue we had in the Fowler case where, yeah, you know, there'd been all that back and forth, and they had this stuff recorded based on the date they finally got their IP PIN number. So you see this, and I think we're going to be battling this sort of thing with the IRS for quite a while because the computer systems are just going by that one date. They don't really handle nuance well. And they don't handle this kind of unusual situation where there's a filing date, but there's a much later date when we discover that the original return, the return we got was actually valid. And even though we delayed processing it for seven, eight months due to a situation like this, or due to a situation like Fowler, that that still first date is what counts for statute purposes. The IRS systems are obviously not currently set up to handle that, or at least if they are, somebody doesn't know how to enter stuff in them because we've seen two of these cases. The other thing you might ask was, well, why didn't counsel realize, you know, that they had nothing to stand on? I've seen cases like this quite often with the summary opinion cases. And my take is I really think staff there, first thing is most summary opinion cases are slam dunk for the IRS. It doesn't take much prep because, you know, they're, they're, they're protesting things that have no shot whatsoever. I get the feeling that, that the attorneys assigned to this tend to be inexperienced quite often. Uh, at least that would be my impression, be the smart thing to do, because this is like you don't really need you don't really need the most experienced attorney uh, who's used to litigating, you know, the big cases to handle these cases in this area, these summary opinion cases. And probably, you know, they don't actually look at them in much detail until we get to trial, unless somebody has actually been pushing from the other side. So I think that's how we end up with these cases and these weird results. The first case, the Fowler case, I think that was one where the service was legitimately trying to push this position. But as this case points out, they haven't yet really internalized the fact they lost Fowler. And that's where we're going to continue to see this sort of thing come up. Well, hopefully you had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, you're back coming out here. We're heading into December, right? The last month of the year, tax planning month with maybe a new tax law. 
We'll talk about that if it shows up, and we'll talk about where it goes. But otherwise, you know, stay here. We'll keep you up on what's going on. I'm sure we're going to see more draft forms, instructions, more developments coming out of those sorts of things. So we'll talk about that going forward. Uh, as I always note, you can email me, Ed Zollers at CurrentFlowTaxDevelopments.com. If you have any questions, comments, etc., about this podcast, and we can talk to you there. I also pay attention to postings on the Connect sites for Arizona, New Jersey, Minnesota, Illinois, Washington, uh, and take a look at Idaho's uh, discussion site, too. So if you're on there, you have questions, you raise things, I may very well jump into those discussions. And I said, I think they're really useful uh, areas to make, really helpful to make use of there and to become part of a discussion group like that. It's amazing how much you learn and how much you get to learn that becomes insanely useful in the practice by being back and forth and you anticipate things much easier because you're on top of what's happening if you're in a discussion group like that. So I certainly encourage you to take time in there uh, for that one, for the ones I'm involved in or other ones, you know, for societies and areas where I'm not members of. There are some really useful groups out there. Otherwise, I'm going to be back here next week. We'll talk to you about whatever comes up here the first week of December, uh, seeing what happens with updates. I am working on my last, working on my courses for December. I've got a number of those. We go really fast and furious through the 15th and everything kind of calms down from the 15th on. So we'll take a look at that and we'll see what else happens here in the area of current federal tax developments.